Hello, this is Professor White, and I will be talking about natural selection and the theory of evolution. We will start first with this Darwin's voyage. Now, in 1831, Charles Darwin traveled the ship called HMS Beagle. So on his voyage, he actually collected specimens of rocks, fossils, animals, and plants. So along with the voyage, he come across the Galapagos Island. So on the Galapagos Island, Darwin observes strange creatures like the giant tortoises, marine iguanas, and flightless cormorants. So as you can see here on this picture, this is what he found in this unique enchanted island as what it was called way back. So according to Darwin's observation and his discovery, as fascinated as these creatures were, it was not these creatures that made Darwin famous. In fact, it was his discovery of some simple finches that made his observation very significant. So when Darwin discovered these finches, he thought that each of the bird was a completely unrelated kind of species of birds. But after returning to England, so Darwin showed his specimen to an ornithologist who confirmed that the birds were not different kinds of birds, but different varieties of the same kind or species of birds. So that said, he came to realize that there is something going on. So at the time of his discovery, selective breeding was very common in domesticated breeds of animals. So Darwin noticed similarities between the practice of selective breeding of domesticated plants and animals and the different varieties of finches that he found. So the selective breeding of plants and animals that Darwin observed is often referred to as artificial selection. But Darwin made a hypothesis that something was happening in nature that was like artificial selection, but it was happening and occurring naturally rather than by direction of man. So now he called this phenomenon the natural selection. So what's the difference between artificial and natural selection? So this left-hand side, as you can see here, the wild mustard is actually kind of like manipulated by humans. They pick and choose what they made and then they come up with different kinds of varieties like cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kale, and kohlrabi. So that's an artificial selection. Same with, of course, the wolf that has been artificially selected or selected. Um, the traits were selected and they made these wolves mate to come up with these varieties of dogs. But natural selection, according to Darwin, that these birds or these finches are actually of similar kind. It's just that they change over time and that it kind of like split into different um, kinds, but they're all finches. Now, the only thing Darwin needed was a mechanism to explain what causes the natural selection to occur. So then Darwin noticed that each finch had a unique beak size and shape that assisted them in eating. Um, this particular type of food that was most abundant in each island. Now, after observing the different beak sizes and shapes, then Darwin discovered the mechanism he needed to explain natural selection. Now, these are the four principles Darwin used to explain what causes natural selection. First, all living things have variety within species. Second, traits are inherited from parents to offspring. Third, species compete with one another for limited resources like food, shelter, water, nutrients, etc. And those individuals that inherit an advantageous trait from their parents will be more fit to survive and therefore more successful in reproducing and passing on their genes to the next generation. So because of this, Darwin published his book, on the origin of species by means of natural selection in 1859. And in his book, Darwin introduced a new controversial idea he called the theory of evolution. Now, Darwin's proposed that if natural selection could produce small changes in species by natural selection, then it perhaps in theory, these small changes could gradually produce much larger changes if given a very large quantity of time. In other words, he introduced a theory 
that natural selection might cause evolution to occur if given enough time. Now, natural selection and evolution are not the same thing. Natural selection produces small changes in populations to produce new species or varieties of the same species, kind of like a subspecies. Um, now, natural selection is generally accepted as a fact and can be directly observed, repeated, and tested. However, natural selection can often occur in just a few generations. What are some examples of it? So the Bergman and Allen's rule, these are all <laughs> rabbits, of course, um, but they kind of like speciated into three different types, the snowshoe hare, the desert jackrabbit, and the cottontail rabbit. So that's an example of natural selection. Here's another example of natural selection, which is the uh, resistance of bacteria to antibiotics, as you can see here in this example. Now, what about evolution? Now, well, evolution is a theory that offers one possible explanation for the origin of all living things. Now, it suggests that all living things have a common ancestor in the past. Now, because this theory is based on something that may have occurred in the past, we cannot actually directly observe it, repeat it, or test it. So what is an example of evolution. So as you can see here, the, the T-Rex and your black-capped chickadee. Let's take a look at their similarities and differences. For reptiles, they're cold-blooded, birds, warm-blooded, skin, scale, uh, skin with scales for reptiles, and then feathers for the covering for the birds. As you can see here, that the reptiles have, uh, they've, they're, they're changes. There are similarities, but at the same time, there are differences, which tells us that there is change going on over time. Same with Archaeopteryx, which believed was the ancestor of the current, current birds that we have. Same is true with these Hudson baby chicks. They have claws which are used for climbing, which is why in Darwin's Tree of Life, as you can see here that there is an ancestral protista or an ancestral um, organism where everything is rooted from. Now, during the time in the past that is often referred to as the Cambrian explosion, all almost all representatives of every animal phylum alive today suddenly appear or show up in the fossil records. As you can see here, so that's basically... Um, evidence that there are several organisms that appeared and are alive today in the back in time. Now let's move on to species. Now what is a species? Now the definition of a species is, has historically been subjective. So there is what we call the typological species concept or morphological species concept, which is based on similarities and differences of the physical characteristics of organisms. And there's also this biological species concept, which is based on whether organisms can interbreed or produce viable and fertile offspring. Now, most biologists consider the biological species concept the best method to determine what species is. So in short, Biological species concept of what a species is, is based on if the organism can interbreed and produce viable and fertile offspring. So here's an example. What, why use the biological species concept? Now the western meadow lark and the eastern meadow lark look alike and live in overlapping regions, but they have different songs and they do not breed with one another. Are they the same species? Well, most uh, biologists say no because they do not interbreed. So that's what the biological species concept means. Now, some species can interbreed and have offspring, but their offspring are typically unviable or unable to survive or sterile. Now, some examples of these hybrids between um, uh, between species are mules, zonkeys, ligers, pizzlies, bears and buffalo. So these are all, um, they, in, they, they actually interbreed, but their offspring ends up uh, sterile or they, they don't come alive or unviable to survive. So that is the biological species concept.
Now let's go to speciation. Now natural selection can cause speciation to occur. Now speciation is a is the separation of one species into two or more species. Now speciations usually begin with genetic drift. And genetic drift occurs when the frequencies of alleles in a population change. Now, a form of genetic drift can occur when a small population uh, branches off from a large population. And this is called bounder effect. So this is how it looks like. So a few individuals from a population started a new population with different allele frequencies than the original population. So you can see here in this a visual. So that's the simplified way of um, explaining founder's effect. Now there are two common ways that speciation often occur and these are called allopatric and sympatric speciation. Allopatric speciation occurs when the population of the organisms become separated or isolated by a geographical barrier. Now a geographical barrier can be a mountain range, a large river, a canyon, an ocean, or a desert. So here's an example of um, allopatric speciation. Now the Albert squirrel found on the south rim of um, the Grand Canyon and the Kaibab squirrel found on the north rim are separated by the Grand Canyon. So you can see over here. So this is an example of an allopatric speciation. Now sympatric speciation can occur when populations become isolated um, by ecological factors instead of geographical factors. Now, what are those um, ecological factors? Now, it can be different habitats, maybe occupied or different niche. Niche means a job or a role in the ecosystem, their, their, their role in the ecosystem change, or maybe established, um, or maybe a different resource may be used. Now, any of these factors can cause genetic drift uh, within a population of organisms living in the same area. Now, an example is the cichlid fish species in Africa's Lake Victoria, which is a very good example of sympatric speciation. So here's an example. As you can see here, all of these are cichlid fish. And so one cichlid fish is a fish eater, the other is snail, algae, a scraper, leaf eater, insect eater, and zooplankton eaters. As you can see here, this is a result of a sympatric speciation because their roles in the ecosystem change as well as their preference of food, which is an ecological factor. Now the next is reproductive isolation. Now after speciation occurs, reproductive isolation must occur for a new population of organisms to become a separate species. Now, reproduction must not occur. One type of um, reproductive isolation is your prezygotic isolation, which occurs when allele frequencies change dramatically enough that reproduction is prevented from occurring between two populations. And this may be due to different factors like reproductive timing, behavior, and habitat. And a good example of this is the Pacific salmon. Now, what about the postzygotic? Isolation. Now, postzygotic isolation occurs when two organisms can reproduce, but the offspring are sterile or unviable. An example of this is a mule. Uh, now, a donkey's diploid number is 62, and a horse's diploid number is 64. Now, a hybrid mule has a diploid number of 63, which make the mule sterile and unable to reproduce. Now, the offspring can also be unviable or unable to survive or develop normally to produce. And this is called postzygotic isolation. Now, what are the four different forces of natural selection? Now, the four forces of natural selection can be push or, or, or drive natural selection in a specific direction, which referred to as stabilizing, directional, disruptive, or sexual selection. Let's start first with stabilizing selection. Now, it occurs when the intermediate or average form of traits is selected. Now, stabilizing selection operates to eliminate extreme traits. So this is um, a visual example. As you can see here in this butterfly, the two extremes, the one on the left and on the right of the arrow, are actually eliminated. And then the one in the middle, that's the most common allele frequency in a stabilizing selection. Same is true with um, the birth mass. As you can see, both extremes are eliminated. 
except for the most average, uh, the most average, which is the, the top of the bell shape. So that is called stabilizing selection. Now, what about directional selection? Now, directional selection is one extreme form of trait is favored or selected, as you can see here. So if, let's say, for example, the modern horse's trait is favored, then it goes to the direction with the most favorable trait, which is the extreme form of traits. Also, same with, let's say, for example, in this butterfly, as you can see here, the most extreme form of trait is the one that's being favored, then therefore it will be more abundant, as you have to say. Also, let's now move on to disruptive selection, which is a form of selection that selects for the two different extreme forms of trait that selects against the average form of a trait. So in this example, both extremes use mimicry as a camouflage strategy. So the female mimics unpalatable species. So it kind of favors that trait as well as the other extreme trait, which is um, the female mimics a different unpalatable species. As you can see here, there are two both uh, peaks on those extreme ones, um, as opposed to the male or female is palatable and does not mimic any unpalatable species. So that's the one that is not favored, but those two extremes on both left and right are two different extreme forms, which is favored that causes disruptive selection. Last but not least, some forces of selection do not enhance an organism's fitness or ability to survive, but rather advertises an organism's health and dominance. This type of selection is called sexual selection. As you can see here in this peacock that shows off its beautiful feathers and design, um, which attracts, of course, their mate. And that's called sexual selection. I hope that you've learned something about evolution and, of course, the forces that drives natural selection. And I will see you in class. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Have a great day. Bye.